The Napoleon of Notting Hill by G.K. Chesterton, Book One, Chapter One, Introductory Remarks on the Art of Prophecy. The human race, to which so many of my readers belong, has been playing at children's games from the beginning, and will probably do it till the end, which is a nuisance for all the few people who do grow up. And one of the games to which it is most attached is called Keep Tomorrow Dark, which is also named by the rustics in Shropshire, I have no doubt, cheat the prophet. The players here listen very carefully and respectfully to all that the clever men have to say about what it is to happen in the next generation. The players then wait until all the clever men are dead and then bury them nicely. They then go and do something else. That is all. For a race of simple tastes, however, it is great fun. For human beings, being children, have the childish willfulness and childish secrecy and they never have, from the beginning of the world, done what the wise men have seen to be inevitable. They stoned the false prophets, it is said, but they could have stoned the true prophets with greater and juster enjoyment. Individually, men may present more or less a rational appearance, eating, sleeping, and scheming, but humanity as a whole is changeful, mystical, fickle, delightful. Men are men, but man is a woman. But in the beginning of the twentieth century, the game of Cheat the Prophet was made far more difficult than it had ever been before. The reason was that there were so many prophets and so many prophecies that it was difficult to elude all their ingenuities. When a man did something free and frantic and entirely his own, or a horrible thought struck him afterwards, it might have been predicted. Whenever a duke climbed a lamppost, when a dean got drunk, he could not really be really happy. He could not be certain that he was not fulfilling some prophecy. And the beginning of the 20th century, you could not see the ground for clever men. They were so common that a stupid man was quite exceptional, and when they found him, they followed him in crowds down the street, and treasured him up, and gave him some high post in state. And all these clever men were at work giving accounts of all that would happen in the next age, all quite clear, all quite keen-sighted and ruthless, and all quite different. And it seemed to all that the good game of hoodwinking your ancestors could not really be managed this time, because the ancestors neglected meat and sleep and practical politics, so they might meditate day and night on what their descendants would be likely to do. But, but the way the prophets of the 20th century went to work was this. They took something or the other that was certainly going on in their time, and then said it would go on more and more until something extraordinary happened. And very often they added in some odd place that extraordinary thing had happened, and it was, and it showed the signs of the times. Thus, for instance, there were Mr. H. G. Wells and others who thought that science would take charge of the future, and just as the motor car was quicker than the coach, so some lovely thing would be quicker than the motor car, and so on forever. And there rose from their ashes Dr. Quillip, who said that a man could be sent on his machine so fast around the world that he could keep up a long, chatty conversation with some old world village by saying a word of a sentence, and each time he came around. And it was said that the experiment had been tried on an apocalyptic old major, who was sent around the world so fast, that it seemed to me, to the inhabitants of some other star, a continuous band around the earth of white whiskers, red complexion, and tweeds. A thing like the Ring of Saturn. And then there was the opposite school. There was Mr. Edward Carpenter, who thought that we would, in very short time, return to nature, to live simply and slowly as the animals do. And Edward Carpenter was followed by James Pickey, DDE, of Pocahontas College, who said that people were immensely improved by grazing, or taking their food slowly and continuously after the manner of cows. And he said that he had, with the most encouraging results, turned city men out on all fours in a field covered with veal cutlets, then Tolstoy and humanitarians whole story and the humanitarians said that the world was growing ever more merciful, and therefore no one should have any desire to kill. And Mr. Mick said not only became an and Mr. Mick not only became a vegetarian, but at length declared vegetarianism doomed. Shedding, he called it final, finally, the green blood of the silent animals, and predicted that a man of better age would live on nothing but salt. Then there came a pamphlet from Oregon where the thing was tried and the pamphlet was called, Why Should Salt Suffer? And there was more trouble. On the other hand, some people were predicting that their lines of kinship would become narrower and sterner. There was Mr. Cecil Rhodes, who thought that the one thing of the future was the British Empire, 
That would be the gulf between those who are of the empire and those who are not. Between the Chinaman in Hong Kong and the Chinaman outside. Between the Spaniard on the Rock of Gibraltar and the Spaniard off it. Similar to the gulf between man and the lower animals. And in the same way, his impetuous friend, Dr. Zoppi, the Paul of Anglo-Saxonism, carried it yet further, and he held that, as a result of this view, cannibalism should be held to no mean eating a member of the empire, should, cannibalism should be held to mean eating a member of the empire, not eating the subject peoples, who should, he said, be killed without needless pain. His horror at the idea of eating a man in British Gu Gu Guinea showed how misunderstood his stoicism, who thought him devoid of feeling. He was, therefore, in a hard position, as it was said, he had tried to attempt the experiment, and living in London, had to subsist entirely on, or on Italian organ grinders. And his end was terrible, for just as he had begun, Dr. Pill Swiller, Dr. Paul Swiller read his great paper in the Royal Society, proving that the savages were not only right in eating their enemies, but right on moral and hygienic grounds, since it was true that the qualities of the enemy, when eaten, when eaten, passed into the eater. The notion that the nature of an Italian organ man was irrevocably growing and burgeoning inside him was almost more than the kindly old professor could bear. Then there was Mr. Benjamin Kidd, who said that the growing note of our race would be the care for knowledge of the future. His idea was formed more powerfully by William Borker, who wrote the passage that every schoolboy knows by heart, about men in future ages weeping at the graves of their descendants, and tourists being shown over the scene of the historic battle, which was to take place some centuries afterward. And Mr. Stead, too, was prominent, who thought that England would become in the 20th century united to America, and his young lieutenant, Graham Podge, concluded that the states of France, Germany, and Russia, and the American Union, the states of Russia being abbreviated to RA. There was Mr. Sidney Webb, also, who said that the future would see a continuously increase in order and neatness in the life of people, and his poor friend Phipps, who went mad and ran about the country with an axe, hacking branches off the trees whenever there were not the same number on both sides. All these clever men were prophesying with every variety of ingenuity on what would happen soon, and they all did it in the same way, by taking something they saw as going strong, as the saying is, and carrying it as far as ever their imagination could stretch. This, they said, was the true and simple way of anticipating the future. Just as, said Dr. Pelkins in a fine passage, just as, when we see the pig, and a litter fatter than the other pigs, we know that as an unalterable law of the inscrutable, it will some day be larger than an elephant, just as we know, when we see weeds and dandelions growing more and more thickly in a garden, that they must, in spite of all of our efforts, grow taller than the chimney pots and swallow the house from sight. So we know and reverently, reverently acknowledge that when any power in the human politics is shown for any period of time in any considerable activity, it will go on until it reaches the sky. And it did certainly appear that the prophets had put in the people had put the people, engaged in the old game of cheat the prophet, and a quite unprecedented difficulty. It seemed really hard to do anything without fulfilling some of their prophecies. But there was, nevertheless, in the eyes of the laborers in the streets and the peasants in the fields, of the sailors and children, and especially women, the strange look that kept the wise men in a perfect fever of doubt. They could not fathom the motionless mirth in their eyes. They still had something up their sleeve. They were still playing the game of cheat the prophet. And the wise men grew like wild things, and swayed hither and thither, crying, How can it be? What can it be? What will London be like a century hence? Is there anything we have not thought of? Houses upside down? More hygienic, perhaps? Men walking on hands? To make feet flexible, don't you know? Moon? Motor cars? No heads? And so they swayed and wondered, until they died, and were buried nicely. Then the people went and did as they liked. Let me no longer conceal the painful truth. The people had cheated the prophets of the 20th century. When the curtain goes up on the story, 80 years after the present date, London is almost exactly what it is now. End of chapter 1. I like it. I'm going to enjoy this book.